the second talk is entitled Linear Cooper Analysis of DES with Asymmetries. The authors are Andrew Beckhorn, uh, Philip Wenner, and Philip will give us the talk. All right, uh, let me know if I'm shouting. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, about TDS, so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so a little teaser for you guys, what we did was we wanted to revisit the linear curve analysis of TDS. Uh, and we did this by building some new statistical models for both the right key and the wrong key distributions in this attack. Um, and this is the first real improvement of the attack since Matsui's attack in uh, '94. In so there was a little bit of uh, some new analysis by Shino in 2001, but this was just reanalysis of the old attack, so there was no change in the, in the actual attack technique. And also this is the first uh, successful attack on DS that uses multiple linear approximations. Uh, so there's been some attempts before but that weren't really successful. Um, and what's most interesting is that this attack uh, exploits some of these asymmetries in these uh, distributions that we'll have a look at. So, linear curve analysis was introduced in 93 by Matsui specifically to attack DES uh, with great success, and it was actually the first experimental break of DES. Um, so what it does is we have these uh, input-output masks, and we look at the probability of the parity indicated by these inputs and output, uh, being equal for the plain text and the ciphertext. Uh, and this probability here, uh, of course, depends on the key. Uh, and if this correlation is large, we can use this as a distinguisher. Um, so even though there have been quite a few improvements of uh, linear cryptanalysis and a lot of extensions, none of these is really applied to DES so far. Um, so the key recovery part of linear cryptanalysis works as follows, using Matsui's algorithm 2. Uh, so we obtain some plain text ciphertext pairs, and then we have some good uh, linear uh, approximation over, say, r minus two rounds, and then we uh, guess some out round key bits. We encrypt here, we decrypt here, and we check the correlation here. So the idea is that for a uh, right key guess, we get a high correlation indicated by our good approximation. And if we guess wrong, well, then we get some, diff uh, some uh, different mapping from P star to C star, which hopefully has a low correlation. So we use this uh, as a distinguisher to indicate whether this guess was right or wrong. Now, the important part here is then, uh, how do the correlation distribution for a right and a wrong key look? This totally determines how powerful our attack is. Um, and our main tool is this uh, equation here. So this is uh, what we'll or what is known as the linear hole, basically. This sum is a sum over all linear trails starting with alpha and ending with beta. Um, and it's a sum over all the correlation, distribution, uh, correlation contributions of each linear trail adjusted by some sign. And this sign is key dependent. Um, so of course, the linear hole is quite large and we can't look at all trails. So what we'll do is we'll use this model by Bogdanov and Tishau, Tishauzen. Uh, where we consider some subset of the trails. So we'll call this the signal. And this uh, subset should be a subset of strong trails to get a good indicator of the sum here. The unknown part we'll model as this normal distribution. So this is basically just the correlation of an ideal cipher. So we'll just, that's kind of uh, just pure noise here. So for DS, uh, this term won't matter too much because we have very strong uh, dominant trails. Uh, but we'll include it for, for completeness. So, what previous attacks in DES has considered was just that, uh, or assumes that DES has one dominant trail. So it has one trail that is very strong, uh, the sum, so we can approximate this sum by just a single term. What this means is that the correlation value practically only takes two values, plus or minus this uh, correlation uh, contribution, which gives us this uh, assumption about right key equivalence. And what this basically says is that the expected value of the absolute uh, correlation is fixed. So there's only one absolute value that we'll observe. And the question, or our question here, was is this assumption actually true? Well, let's have a look. Uh, so we enumerated uh, some thousand trails 
uh, for a good approximation, one of the approximations used in the original attack. So this is our signal. And this signal actually does have one very dominant trail with this correlation contribution, but it also has a bunch of other trails um, that, do, that they contribute something to the sum. And we looked at this sum for a million keys. And we get this. Um, so this is a picture of the, the probability distribution of this linear correlation. And we do have these two peaks around the plus minus this value here, which is fine. But if we look a little closer, this is the positive half, we see this kind of weird distribution. So here is the value of the dominant trail, which is fine. But what is interesting is that we actually have a higher probability of getting a value that's lower than what we would expect under this key equivalence uh, assumption. And we also have this peak down here, which is uh, even higher. So we don't have strictly just one value. Um, so what we propose is to model this, so you can see this kind of like some overlapping normal distribution. So we propose to model this as a mixture of normal distributions. This basically means this is a distribution where we pick a normal distribution, uh, pick between normal distributions with some probability. Um, so here we have fitted a model uh, with three normal distributions. The one you see in the middle here corresponds to the dominant trail, so what you would assume, uh, what you assume under the old model. And the interesting thing is this only accounts for about 30% of the actual correlation value. Um, so what you see here in red are the components of this mixture model, and the green is the full distribution, which fits quite nicely to what we measure. Um, so we can get a good estimate of our right key distribution using this model here. Um, so for the wrong key model, well, what Matsui uh, kind of reason was that for wrong key, you guess you get something that looks fairly random, so you should get a correlation very close to zero. Um, and Chishausa redefined or refined this uh, thing and, and said, well, maybe it looks more like a random permutation, which we know doesn't have quite correlation zero. But instead, the, the correlation is distributed like this normal distribution here, where n is the block size. Um, but again, this might be a little bit optimistic for a cycle like DS that has extremely strong trails. Even if we guess the wrong key, we probably don't get something that looks completely random. So we see what actually happens here. As I said before, if we guess wrong key, then uh, we have this mapping over some other cipher. And what does this cipher look like? Well, it looks like this. So first we have a decryption, then we have an R-round encryption, and then we have a round of decryption again. So instead of looking at just a random permutation, we'll look at this cipher here, this related cipher. And if we do this, well, we can again do our trail search, find a signal. And if we then look at this correlation distribution, it looks really weird. Uh, so I'm not saying that this is necessarily what the real distribution looks like. Uh, but it's probably something close. Um, but the important part here is that if we look and compare this to the distribution of a random cipher, then the variance is quite a lot larger than what we would expect. So obviously this, uh, this random uh, distribution here is quite optimistic in this case. Okay, cool. Uh, so now we have a model for the right key and the wrong key, but in most cases we're not interested in actually um, sampling the whole code book so we can actually measure this correlation accurately. We want to uh, only use a small part of the, a relatively small part of the code book. Um, and if we do this, we can show that we just need to add this normal distribution with a variance 1 over n, then we go to our, uh, our actual undersample distribution. And that looks like something like this. You kind of lose all this weird structure that we've been seeing, and this is very close to the model that Matsui actually uses. But I want to stress that this only works if your n is uh, quite a bit smaller than your code book size. So if you have these very marginal attacks, then you should be careful about how these uh, distributions actually look. Okay, so we can also extend this to multiple approximations. Uh, and the uh, models are totally analogous. We just have a, for the right key, uh, we have a mixture of uh, multivariate normal distributions. And you have a, a, a multivariate normal distribution for the wrong key. And what it visually looks like is this. The blue here is the right key, and the red is the wrong key. 
And here we have two approximations. So we have uh, four of these uh, mixture components here. Um, and in this model, we just say that they occur with equal probability. So in a bit, we'll look at what happens if you don't have exactly this picture, where all the components are, are present. So now we want to know how can we distinguish between this blue distribution and the red distribution as best as possible. So some work was done on this by Buyukov in 2004. And they proposed a model that basically uses, uh, well, a test statistic B here, which is just the probability of X, which is the correlation that we observe, that this uh, correlation occurs in this distribution. So this only uses the right key distribution. Um, so I'll show you what this looks like in a bit, but what we need to know is the success probability of this thing. Uh, that's pretty obvious. It's the probability that we classify a right key as a right key. And then the advantage, which is related to the false positive rate, so it's a measure of how many wrong uh, keys do we classify as the right key. So let's look at this visually. Um, the classifier will look at this green uh, outline here, and it'll say that anything uh, inside this area is probably a right key, and everything outside is a wrong key. Well, intuitively, that's not the best idea, because what if I have an observation all the way out here? Well, I probably shouldn't classify that as a wrong key. Um, so for a fixed success probability, this has an advantage of 3.1 bits. So I'll get back to what that uh, signifies in a bit. Um, but this doesn't seem like the best idea. So what we propose is a new classifier, which takes into account both the right key probability and the wrong key probabilities. This is basically just a likelihood ratio of uh, an observation occurring. And if you look at the picture for that, then this uh, distinguishing line here looks quite differently. So anything in here will be classified as a wrong key, and anything outside will be classified as a right key. Uh, and I guess this is something like what you would draw if I told you to draw this intuitively. Um, so anything out here will also be classified as a right key guess, which intuitively makes sense. And we can see for the same success probability, we get an, a boost in advantage. Higher advantage is good. Um, so we actually get a couple of bits just by changing our classifier a bit. OK, so now to the actual attack. We identified uh, two sets of four uh, good linear approximations. And these also include the approximations that Matsui originally used. But what I would put here is the dominant trails for these approximations. And what we can see here, which is interesting, is that uh, this approximation and this approximation, for example, have the same dominant trail, uh, or in fact, dominant key trail. What I mean by that is that the sign of these approximations are defined by the same key bits. Um, so if we look at their distributions here, uh, so again, blue is right key and uh, red is wrong key, then the joint distribution of this gamma 1 and gamma 3 here is not symmetrical. So if one just one correlation here is negative, then the other is always positive, and vice versa. Um, and that should give us some extra distinguishing power. Like this, this should maybe be easier to distinguish than in this case here. And the same down here. Uh, by the way, we actually verified these distributions. So this is the model distribution. We verified these practically by doing experiments. And they match very well. Um, so let's see what happens with our uh, likelihood classifier in this case. Well, now we get these lines here. So anything in here would be a wrong key, and everything out here would be a right key. And we see that we, again, get a boosted advantage. So it's much easier to distinguish in this asymmetric case than in the symmetrical case. Uh, and that will give us some, some boost in our attack power. So let's see what the effect actually is. So we have here a uh, data complexity versus advantage. And we down here have the old Bayesian model. And up here, we have the likelihood model, our new model. And we see for both of them, when we move from uh, a symmetric case to an asymmetric distribution, then we get a boost in, in, uh, in advantage by one and a half bits or so. And by going from the Bayesian model to the likelihood model, we get uh, something like five bits higher advantage. Um, so both of these things kind of help us out. Okay, um, so let's see what that actually translates to in, 
and attack. So here we have our data complexity versus, versus computational complexity. Um, and we can compare, well, so we have two different types of attack here. We choose two points in these curves here. So one, uh, compared to Matsui's original attack, uses uh, slightly less data and uh, has a, a better time complexity. And one uses much less uh, data, which in some cases can be more useful, uh, versus a slightly higher uh, type complexity. So the point here is that we should be careful when we look at these linear models, uh, be careful uh, just to make assumptions about what the correlation distribution looks like, especially for very marginal attacks. Um, and it should, you should also try to look for these asymmetric distributions. It would be very interesting to see if these weird distributions can be used uh, to, to gain stronger attacks for, for other types as well. So, thank you for your attention. of uh, uh, what people in machine learning are doing, trying to separate. And uh, uh, it's known that uh, linear separators are uh, not going to capture uh, certain divisions of the uh, multidimensional space, and they're using kernel methods. Have you looked at kernel methods in machine learning in order to, uh, to see what is the best way, how to distinguish between those various collection of things? Uh, no, not yet. So I, I looked at a bunch of different methods to try to come up with, with something nice for this case in particular, right? Uh, and here the this likelihood ratio seems to be very good. Um, and and, and, and it, theoretically the likelihood ratio should also be optimal if you if you have a, an accurate picture of the of the probability distributions. So here's one idea that might work or might not work. You insist on classifying uh, every uh, measurement as either a right key or wrong key, but in fact, uh, when you are far away from all those peaks, it is not clear that it is a meaningful measure because you are at very borderline. Yeah, sure. So you may want to classify uh, your measurements as three things, right key, wrong key, or uh, undecided, yeah, or yeah. meaningless. Yeah. And you may find it uh, better to uh, not false the classification on faraway points. Yeah, probably. Um, so one thing you could say is that e even getting an observation out here is of course extremely unlikely to begin with. Um, and so I'm not even sure if that can actually happen because this is not actually a normal distribution, it's a approximation of a discrete distribution, right? So yeah, it might work. Um, I don't know. You could also say that this might not entirely make sense either because just like a point out here could be either. Um, yeah, that's a that's worth looking into. One question. So I have one. Uh, did you try to find any impact on real application? I know DES is broken, but for some applications requiring very low security level, mm. it might be still used somewhere. So, did you try to find a real application in some real usage? Uh, not for DES in particular. So, I know that uh, triple disk is still used in many places, and, and I wanted to look at that, but that seems to still be out of reach even with methods like this. Um, so, no, I haven't seen any real use cases, but, but I have I've seen some other examples of also differential crypt analysis where you have some really extremely weird distributions that might be interesting to look at. So that's also a, uh, yeah, a suggestion for other people to try to look at, at this for differential. That would be really, really cool to see. Any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the 